Hi, this is Tom Broussard. Nice to see everyone. Today's article is about Friedloff Nansen. Um, most of you have never heard of him before. He was a Norway's first brain scientist um, and eventually became a Nobel Peace Prize winner in 1922. Um, so it's very, very interesting. This is one of those scientists, like several, several other scientists who um, had done all their work and nobody knew what they had done. So as a result, um, other scientists got credit for their work and uh, Nansen didn't, wasn't given the credit that he otherwise would have gotten. Um, in his particular case, um, and you get to see all of this in the, in the uh, article, is uh, ob obviously again in Norway. And he um, obviously went to work on his education, eventually wanted to get a PhD. He wasn't exactly sure what he would, uh, what kind of PhD he would do, what kind of research he would do. Um, and uh, while he was just finishing his undergrad, um, he got an invitation really to go on a on a sailing on a on a uh, on a stealer, the people who who are hunting seals, they went on these sealers called the Viking um, to go to sea. It turns out to be a seven six month um, journey um, over to um, Greenland, and while there doing his studies while on the ship, um, he began to understand what he might do when he came back home. Uh, but it was a wonderful trip that he did. Um, he is very good as a skier. Um, it turns out as a marksman, he was very good at shooting seals. Um, and by the time he came back and actually got, got uh, stranded in uh, Greenland by the ice with the ship he was on, uh, eventually the, it warmed up and, and his ship got out of there and he got back to uh, warmer waters. But when he got home, he decided not to do what he had been doing in terms of his PhD and went into a local uh, Bergen museum and spent five, six years there working on neuroanatomy about the uh, uh, central nervous system and especially with lower marine um, uh, uh, creatures, as it were, fish and smaller, even smaller than that. Um, the um, so he uh, needed a, a microscope, a good one. He'd been using the bad ones. Turns out he's also a very good artist, um, very good at drawing what he could see through his microscope. Um, and he was so good. It's when you look at his pictures, his pictures look almost exactly like uh, Santiago Ramon y Cajal, who you have heard about that, at least through my series this year. Um, his pictures that he had driven, written by hand, look just like uh, Kajal's, which is very interesting because they turned out to be at odds without really knowing that they were at odds in terms of having discovered this same exact kind of idea, um, but Nansen getting it first, as it were. So um, he went into that. He studied it hard. He got a good microscope. Um, he did a lot of work to, to understand um, uh, um, how to use that microscope and studying the tissues and cells um, of the structure of the nervous system. Well, as he was working on that, he realized he needed more understanding about how the, how the um, chemicals work to stain the cells. Because even back then, as many people were trying to figure this out, it's really difficult even through the microscope to see one cell versus another cell without staining them in a certain way. So you get to see them and not be able to see everything else that's in the way as it were, or behind it. So, um, and he had been standing them, staining them uh, with uh, silver nitrate, but he had heard about um, Golgi, who's another um, person who did a lot of work with that. He's quite famous. Uh, he is the one who went head to head with Kajal. Um, and he actually went from Norway, traveled to Italy to go meet him, uh, spent a couple of months there, learn how to do this new procedure, what was called back then the black uh, uh, technique, which again is the same thing that Kajal had figured out on his own and heard about from Kajal, um, uh, Kolji. And um, 
came back home and was able to then be able to see those well-stained cells all the way through the dendrites and synapses. So he could see all of that, uh, as you see in the article. Uh, and this is on the 1800s, 1880s, 1886, which is also amazing that people in Europe in the 1800s could travel around the world, obviously by ships, sometimes by trains uh, in, the, uh, in the continent. But to be able to do that back then is, continues to amaze me uh, going forward. Um, the, um, and as uh, Nansen was doing his work and studying what he was seeing, he could see that the individual cells were close to each other, but they weren't, as they said, fused. They weren't connected such that they were forever fused. They could see the gap between them, obviously. You've heard about it for this last year, um, that what we now know is that we have all of these cells that become neuro groups and they are uh, they connect with each other and communicate with each other through the synapses, but, and they're, I know, incredibly uh, tight, close, um, but they are not fused as uh, uh, Kajal had, had uh, theorized, uh, became something called the reticular uh, theory, meaning that, that all of those cells were fused such that if you did one thing here, it would make its way through to another place, almost like electricity, almost like wires. Um, and again, that's when uh, Nansen realized that it's not that way. It's not um, fused. They are individual cells and they communicate with each other. Um, again, it takes longer. That's how they figured this out. When you had them all fused, if they were all electricity, electrical wires, and you start at one place at the speed of light, actually, it would go quickly to the other place. And as they did their experiments, they could see that when you did that, um, and something, a, a, a message is delivered here, it takes longer to get here because it takes longer to send a cell and then from electrical, uh, converting that into a chemical message that floats over, picks that up, becomes electrical again, and goes boom, 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 boom. So it takes, quote, longer to get from one place to another, realizing that that's why the cells are not fused and they uh, they move through the cells, electricity, through electrical uh, messages, and then they convert that into chemical, which then floats across to the next cell that grabs that, accepts that, converts that back into electrical um, messages, and then quickly goes to the other side and then um, converts that again into chemical. Obviously, it works incredibly fast, incredibly fast, but not fast enough if in fact, if it were the, the uh, reticular uh, theory that Golgi had uh, espoused. So um, when, not, when uh, Nansen had started doing his paper and his thesis, he wrote a, pep, a paper that basically rebuts what Gar Garji had done. Um, and it was the first uh, formal rebuttal that was in print. And in fact, 18 months ahead of, of Kajal, which we, uh, which I mentioned earlier. So that is where he got somewhat famous along the time um, as he did that. The interesting thing was that um, this guy, Nansen again, I mean, he is the first brain science, uh, brain science person, and he's also the uh, Nobel Peace Prize. He was an ambassador. He was quite a diplomat. He definitely helped with, with peace. Um, and uh, when he was finishing with his PhD, he had, by then he'd figured out or wanted to do another uh, uh, journey over to Greenland and where he had been before with that earlier ship and go there and walk across the bottom uh, by land in Greenland because it's, it's uh, forbidding and it's very difficult and it's all ice uh, and rock. Um, but nobody had ever done it before, and he wanted to do it with his team. Um, so uh, as by then, obviously, while he was writing his dissertation, he was obviously getting ready and preparing for this trip. So he did his his uh, his defense with his with his thesis. Um, and literally, I've read it's either two days or four days later, but very quickly, he took off with his team um, and prepared for the rest of the trip, obviously to sail over to, Greenland, uh, get past all the ice so that he could be deposited 
um, and then walk across. And there were storms and all kinds of things. It ended up taking six months, um, but he did it. But he left, posted his 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 uh, thesis, um, and had no idea whether it was going to be approved or not. He just took off. He obviously um, really didn't care much. He did care a lot, but he wanted to move to to do this next big uh, challenge. Um, so. Uh, and again, I mentioned before that his he was such a good drawer that some of the professors said, you are so good, you should become an artist because clearly, uh, even just looking through the microscope, you can really, really understand what it is you're writing. And he ended up with his dissertation, which is 400, 214 pages. Um, he had 113 illustrations with his own hand. And again, when you look at them, you go, oh, that looks like Kajal, if you've ever seen more of his, because I know I had seen more of his too. Um, so, um, but he left and he didn't, he had no idea if he had won or not, as it were. Um, so he took off again, a longer, longer trip. There's several books, several of them are, are cited in my article and made their way. And I, I'm pretty sure nobody died. I mean, it, but it was, it was incredibly tough. Uh, and sometimes they had to separate because the, obviously the ships would get stuck. The storms came. Uh, they went to a place that they didn't expect to go um, just because of the storm with hardly any food. They, the only food they really had was to kill uh, animals along the way. <coughs> Excuse me. So he finally made it to the west coast of, of Greenland. He gets there, believe it or not, and this is what's so darn funny, is because they walk in, they basically walk into this little town that is now called Nook. Um, in 1888, they walked into town. And as they're walking now, of course, their local world of, of Norway and Greenland, everybody knew he was going. It was in the press. They're keeping an eye on him as best they could and putting it in the press. Um, so even the town, hoping whenever he would get here, as long as they would all survive, um, so as he walked into town, they, they did have an emissary who was looking for him and waiting. And they could see these clearly frozen people coming into town. And literally the person walks up to him and he says, are you Nansen? And he says, yes. He says, well, welcome to town. I am so glad that you got your, your a PhD, that you got your doctorate. Uh, and Nansen was so shocked literally there's another book he wrote about he was so shocked because all he just wanted to live and make this journey <laughs> and when this guy who had never met before walks up to him and says oh i'm just telling you you got your phd your your dissertation he, he was totally stunned and basically almost started laughing to say what what is this all about because for six months he was dedicated to doing this and he really didn't think that it had much to do with his memory even before that. Um, so it was really quite something. Uh, and it turns out that his um, uh, thesis was so advanced um, that even back then they thought it's so advanced that we're not even sure if this is really scientifically proven, although they did approve it, of course. And, and as they say now, it's considered a classic because, because he really had done so much work in that one um, dissertation that he had done. But at that point, um, that was the end of his work, uh, even though he was the per precursor to the neuron, um, neuron uh, doctrine that was what we now understand is how Kajal had written about and proposed and now becomes the theory that exists today is the neuron uh, doctrine in terms of the, um, the not uh, reticulated theory of Golgi. So, um, and this, like I say, he did all this 18 months before Kajal, who in fact, Kajal knew who he was and mentioned one mention that he had seen and had heard about um, uh, Nansen. So he, that was interesting. Um, many other of the scientific people back then also knew that Nansen had done it and was working on this particular uh, theory, but nobody did much with him and didn't help uh, for him to become more famous than would have been Kajal. But he is still quite famous in, in Norway, very famous there. And uh, if you look at my article and look at some of his books, you'll get a, a real thrill of understanding who this guy was and just how good he was, as they said, even in, in one of the um, uh, quotes, is that he could handle the microscope as well as 
ice, axe, and skis, because he was that good at all of those kinds of things going forward, and was very, very invested in peace in World War II and beyond. I'm sorry, World War I and beyond. So um, along the year, I mentioned to all of you, some of these uh, scientists you know, uh, knowing that some of you would not know um, who they were, but how integrate they are to what you, the readers, and I know about how the brain works. In my case, it was because I had brain injury from a couple of strokes, but the most important one was, was the first one and ended up with aphasia as well and could not read, write, and speak well. So to be able to now begin to understand how all of these scientists over time, most of mine are in the 1800s, um, came to understand how the brain works with the tools they had at the time. Um, yes, all the tools we have now are very, very helpful as we get to learn even more about how, to, how it works precisely. Uh, but to have all these people working in the 1800s with very cumbersome uh, tools continues to be amazing what they have done. So I do um, appreciate and give praise to Nansen and all of the other articles so far. Um, we have three more um, scientists coming up all this month. That will be the end of the 24 series coming up. Um, I'll probably take a month or two off in 2024 as I get ready for the next set of articles in 2024. Nice to see everyone, and I will see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye.